mashallah so pretty Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hope you're doing well. We're continuing part three of Frederick Nietzsche's The Spoke of Zarathustra. We're, on, we're like on page like 170 ish, and it has been insightful. We were dealing with wit and things of that nature. Let's continue. Bismillah. What you abstain from, too, weaves at the web of all human future. Your nothing, too, is a spider web, and a spider, which lives on the blood of the future. A spider living on the blood of the future. Spider, blood of the future. Now let's break this little thing down. On some old school American bills, you'll see spider webs in the corner. And then if you think about inflation, and the value of the dollar, and how it's able to crumble our society and rob people of their purchasing power of you know and their of their futures then you can kind of see something really interesting there and then if you look at you know how in Islam we get reminded about how weak the spider's house is and that we are not to imitate that spider and thinking that we're secure when in reality when the storm arrives our our home isn't secure or spirituality everything else concerning that so there's a lot of symbolism around the spider so he just gave us another unique one and when you receive it is like stealing you small men of virtue but even among rogues honor says one should still only wear one cannot rob but again okay, let's break down stealing versus robbery now you might be thinking you're both taking something but it's the way in which you do it stealing is has a tone of i went into the underwear aisle and snatched some panties and put them in your jacket right that's stealing robbery is more of like Ch -ch -ch. get out of the car get out of the car pistol whip you know you know, get your foot, kick the person, <laughs> and drive away. Like, robbery denotes more thuggery. You have heists, robbery, theft, you know. Th these are different. It happens in a different way. So, it's, it's good, not good either way, but that's a small nuance there. It will give eventually, that is, another teaching of resignation but i tell you who are comfortable it will take and will take more and more from you oh that you would reject all half-hearted willing and would be welcome become resolute in sloth and indeed so half-hearted uh that's the nice way of saying half-assed my grandpa used to tell me like Move the lawn. You could if the if you don't make the blade spin. Like you have to look at where your the tire is, like the wheel on your lawnmower, and make sure you're lining it up. Otherwise, you get a thin row of grass that wasn't cut, and it doesn't make the lawn look as pretty. You need if you make the lawn this way, that way, this way, that way, the way the grass stalks bend. And then you look at it, it looks quite pretty, you know? So there's an aesthetic to it. But if you half-ass it, as your grandpa would say, it will look boshed, you know? You could tell you didn't put you didn't put a lot of effort. So half-assed and half-hearted are very similar, except half-hearted is more soft, you know, like the way it's being depicted. So that's, he's talking about half-heartedness and that you should be resolute. Resolute. So to be resolute is firm in your decision making, right? 
sloth. You know, you're lethargic. Like, I guess. Uh, like potheads. A lot of potheads become very sloth-like. Slurring their words. Uh, groggy, foggy. People don't... They think they are in a high energetic state because their ideas are bouncing off the walls. But their actual, like... Like, look at your finger. Look at the finger here. You know, you, you're just like... Ugh. You're, you're very sloth-like. And people who smoke pot and then work out, you may be an exception, but let us not pretend that weed, sativa, I believe it's the sativa because there's indica and sativa, that sativa makes you more like, oh, so think about that. Don't be sloth-like, and being a sloth in Islam is not recommended either. Alas, that you would understand my word, do whatever you will. But first, be such as are able to will. Ooh. Oh my goodness. Now, it's a little Luciferian there. Uh, do whatever you will, but first be such as are able to will. That's a very powerful quote because people use that today. Do as thou wilt. You'll see a lot of occultists use that. The inverted world. Okay. But... He has like a caveat here that you're able, right? You're able to carry that out, which shows a certain level of status that you've reached. Do love your neighbor as yourself, but first be such as love themselves, loving with a great love, loving with a great contempt. Thus speaks Arthustra, the godless. But why do I speak where nobody has my ears? It is still an hour too early for me here. I am my own precursor among this people. My own cocks crow through dark lanes. But their hour will come. And mine will come too. Hourly. They are becoming smaller. Poorer. More sterile. Poor herbs. Poor soil. And soon they shall stand there like dry grass and prairie. I'm verily weary of themselves and languishing even more than for water, for fire. So here, this is very deeply um, one because the hour will come sounds a lot like the end times, right? Because he's cause he, being called the godless here, right here he's referring to something, the end of days, the end of time. Day of recompense, judgment day. All the synonyms. And Water, you know, giving life and flourishment, but the fire is to turn it to ash. You know, you become sort of the new vitamin for the soil once everything's been charred. You know, and he's talking about slow decay here when you really examine it hourly. So the hours, click clock, click clock, tick tock, tick tock. Time's going by, you're not watering. A plant dries slowly. The soil erodes slowly. And when soil becomes polluted slowly, nothing can grow in it, you know? And that everything will be so dry that it'll just stop caring for water and actually want to be, you know, taken out. Look at like a dry forest where all the trees are dead they're just none of them survived and it looks quite terrible because you're like oh so you they have controlled burns where they actually can clear that clear away the deadness burn the dead wood and through clearing that it actually like you look and everything's black for a while but later life comes and all that nutrient goes back into the soil. Volcanic ash, actually, you can buy it in the store and it'll be good for your garden. I used to put volcanic ash in my flower pots. So ash in and of itself uh, adds, you know, life back to the soil. So when he said poor soil, and then you fire, you're going to turn to ash, you're going to make that soil rich. And something dry and ugly can be turned into something quite nice. And when the prairie becomes dry and it becomes arid, there is beauty of a, of a desert kind. So 
once you clear away that mess, then everything is kind of plain and a more desertous aesthetic, right? I hope I'm making sense here, but you can see the levels of poetic angles he has going on here. O oh, blessed hour of lighting, O oh, secret before noon, I yet hope to turn them into galloping fires and heralds with fiery tongues. They shall yet proclaim with fiery tongues, it is coming, it is near, the great noon, thus spoke Zarathustra. So the great noon, the sun is highest. So he says, galloping fires, fiery tongues, right? At 12, the sun is right on top of your head and it hurts. You know, that's the, when it's summertime, I don't like going out at noon. Between 12 and 3, it's the hottest and it's miserable. The best is 5, between 5 and 7, or between um, 7 and 9 a.m. So, right on your head. And when we think about galloping fires, think of like a victory charge, you know, Lord of the Rings, or when Sansa's coming with little finger, when the Battle of the Bastards is happening, like that sort of, here comes the truth, here comes help, here comes aid to get rid of the darkness, to get rid of the filth, to burn away everything, to trample, to overcome what has made everything so debased. And then with fiery tongues, when truth is spoken, it can hurt. And when you have someone who's standing, you know, in truth to power, to a tyrant, to a bad boss, someone's just openly lying and scamming, and you're like, no, and you just come with the facts in a very potent way, not disrespectful, but you're coming with the heat, then that's like a, a peppery, fiery tongue, right? So this is a very interesting type of uh, behavior and manners that he's trying to evoke in his disciples. Okay, now the next one is called Upon the Mount of Olives. Winter, a wicked guest, <sighs> come on, why are you going to do winter like that, is sitting at home with me. My hands are blue from the handshake of his friendship. Okay, so frostbite, you know, is cold. I honor this wicked guest, but I like to let him sit alone. <laughs> I like to run away from him. Well, run away to the fireplace, you know. And if one runs well, one escapes him. If you run well because your body temperature goes up, right? And you don't feel the chill in your bones. With warm feet and warm thoughts, I run where the wind stands still. To the sunny nook of my Mount of Olives. There I laugh at my severe guest and am still well disposed towards him for catching the flies at home and for silencing much small noise. So catching the flies, a lot of insects go away during winter. Fleas. And flies um, have a harder time because animal feces, when it's in the sun, it attracts the flies. And they can lay their eggs in it and do whatever. But if a dog poops outside and it's cold, the frost takes it over. There becomes a barrier of ice and the fly can't get to it. So when it says it's like catching flies, it's like you're reducing them and re their population and their numbers and they're not as out there. However, I, I've never had to manage a horse stable or a cow barn during the dead of winter so maybe they are still some that survive but those are heated in any ways at home and for silencing much small noise I like that I, I silencing much small noise so what I like about winter and autumn when it rains you have a lot less troublemakers outside a lot less potheads and drug addicts outside making noise a lot less people walking out with their phone on blast, being retards. There's a lot less menacing gangbangers and degenerates. Because winter, it makes them stay inside where they belong. Locked up in their little cells in a way. Pardon me. And so when I go out, it's nice. In summertime, it's a lot of fitna. But in the wintertime... You can walk out and be in nature, and there's not too many idiots. For he 
does not suffer it when a mosquito would sing. Or even two, he even makes the lane lonely till the moonlight and it is afraid at night. So the mosquito sing in your ear. Because in the summertime, there's more mosquitoes. You can see them, like in some places. Um, they come at, at my grandma's house in Utah. They would come when the sun would start to set. That's when I would see the most of them. And then when the sun would get to a certain level, then you would see the swarms of them. You're like, ah, get a citronella candle. <laughs> Light the tiki torches. Spray yourself with the off spray. <laughs> We're at war. But when it's chilly, and there's like two feet of snow, there's no mosquitoes inside. Mosquitoes have to lay their eggs in warm water and, and mossy pools of water. You know, Brazil had a big problem with the mosquitoes spreading the Zika virus and people had puddles of dirty water. And California has like abandoned pools that turn into swamps. You know, that's why it's important for people to change their bird baths. But the bird baths also get frozen over. So there's that. So when it talks about winter not suffering any mosquito songs, then we can see that's true. So people may not know this because they never lived in a place with snow. So it's always fun when interesting facts are put in such a beautiful and poetic way. He is a hard guest, but I honor him. You see, yeah, winter can be difficult because there's, there's different types of cold. There's that soft powder snow where those wonderful cotton ball-like snow puffs drift from the sky. Then there's wet sleet and the slush. And, you know, it's just like really wet. But then there's terribly, bitterly cold blizzards that snow you in and you can't travel and you can't see much. And so that can be quite hard. And, you know, the leaves are off the trees. The pine trees look nice because they maintain their, their needles. But for the most part, it's like you're not going to have strawberries and arugula salads. Right? Well, now you can because of supermarkets. But imagine you didn't have that. Now it's about meat and potatoes and onions and things that you put in preserved jars. You know, you could have some jams that you made, obviously. But um, it's more of like pumpkins and beef, chicken, t turkeys. You know, you've been fattening them up, readying them for the winter. So when you have like a cold, like it's cold outside, but you have a nice big fire because you've stored up firewood. Uh, or you just have a gas grill or whatever and you have a nice juicy steak on there. It's nice to eat that. And then it's like steaming because it's cold outside and you're just like, you're happy with just like a piece of meat. Maybe you, you know, put on some, something else on the grill that lasted. So, and if you have a greenhouse, you can do pretty okay, right? Uh, there's heated greenhouses and all that kind of fun stuff, but winter can be a hard guess for some people. I do not pray like the pear bird. To the pot-bellied fire idol, even a little chattering of the teeth, rather than adoring idols. Thus my nature dictates, and I have a special grudge against all fire idols that are in heat, steaming, and musty. Whomever I love, I love better in winter than in summer. I mock my enemies better and more heartily, since winter dwells in my home. Hardy, in truth, even when I crawl into bed. Even then my hidden happiness still laughs and is full of pranks. Even the dream that lies to me still laughs. I, a crawler, never in my life have I crawled before the mighty. And if I ever lied, I lied out of love. Therefore I am glad in the wintry bed, too. A simple bed warms me more than a rich one. For I am jealous of my poverty. Ooh, that's a unique line. For I am jealous of my poverty. Uh, a, a simple bed versus a rich one. Now it depends. Are we talking like <sighs> some fancy beds, like the spirals of like a, a wooden beautiful bed frame? If you pull the curtains on that, you're not going to insulate yourself a little bit more. But a nice 
duck feather stuffed pillow can be more comforting than I'd say like a silk pillow, you know, in my opinion. So there's ways of looking at it. And if you've got a good quilt and you don't have a giant comforter with some fancy embroidery, you know, I can see the aesthetic there and the utility. And if you have like a blanket made from fur, that some people would call that, well, some people call that poverty, you know, but you'll be quite warm. So if you think about how people stayed warm before heating systems, it was animal pelts, bison, bear, caribou, you know, deer, people, coyote pelts. It was important, especially for babies, you know, so some people today would be like, oh, because that's so poor, but that's really who we are. So being jealous of your poverty is then not being ashamed of it. No one can shame you for your simple living. And in winter, it is most faithful to me. I begin every day with a bit of malice. I mock the winter with a cold bath. Who? what? Oh man, what are you, a Viking? That makes my severe house guest grumble. Besides, I like to tickle him with a little wax candle to make him let the sky come out of the ashen gray twilight at last. For I am especially malicious in the morning, in that early hour when the pail rattles at the well and the horses whinny warmly through gray lanes. Then I wait impatiently for the bright sky to rise before me at last, the snow-bearded winter sky. The snow-bearded winter sky. I can picture it in my head. The horses with like the steams coming out of their nose. Powdery snow. You're going outside. You see them. like They're happy, you know. The, the sun's coming up. It's going to start warm and get a little bit of that chill up the air. Hey, you know, that, you get the candle there to help you get the day going. And... It's like, it's that pretty silver, ashen gray, as he put it, of winter. I, I quite like it. It's very beautiful, the scene he's describing, actually. The old man with his white hair, the winter sky, so taciturn that I often tactically hides even its sun. Was it from him that I learned the long, bright silence? Ooh, so long, bright silence. The silence of winter. Everyone's in their houses in summertime. You can hear kids outside playing soccer. You hear the beetles. <laughs> Crickets. The June bug beetles are pretty big. <laughs> in my grandma's house in Utah, they would like swarm on the door. Like we have a screen and they're like big too. And they'd be like, <laughs> they would make a noise. And then you're like, get off the screen. So they make noises during the day. And then at night, here, I really enjoy the the crickets. It's like a chorus. It's, they're loud, some of them. It's very relaxing. In winter, you don't hear them. So there's a different kind of silence in winter. And actually, if you recall on my community tab, I posted that there was like this Antarctica hotel. And it was like super remote, obviously. But people talk about the silence there, and I was just like, that must, I wonder what that feels like. Because the city is disgustingly noisy. And even when you try to go hiking, people who are addicted to music will play like really disgusting thug rap on speakerphone. And so you can't even hear the birds because someone's talking about booty shaking and robbing. And you're just like, can you turn that crap off, put your headphones on? Like, of course you're not becoming relaxed in nature because you brought the... The, the, the wickedness of the city to the forest. So why did you even come then? And you're ruining it for everyone else, but I digress. So the long silence of, of winter, there is a brightness to it and a different kind of joy. I think the Christmas season kind of reflects that a little bit. There's a coziness to it. There's a coming together. But when you go outside, it's just, it's very still. If you've ever been skiing and you're on the mountain peaks, sure you can hear people going down the slopes, but it's you. It's you and it's just different. In the summertime, you go in the forest, you hear the birds, they're all chirpity chappity. You may even hear a fox. At night, you may hear a coyote, but it's just different in the wintertime. And it's very relaxing. 
And I think that that silence allows you to be alone with your own thoughts more. It allows you to have more introspection. I saw, like, for example, I saw there was a post where a woman said anything to not be alone with my thoughts. She had, like, a computer, her phone, she had four screens on of different things at the same time while she was eating. And then I saw another one of a kid where he was scrolling on his phone and then has the TV and then you're like, this is kind of strange what we're getting at. Now I'll use background player, like I'll listen to a podcast and then I'll look at pictures of mountains and stuff, you know, multitasking. But I think when you have moving images, two screens of moving images like that, like you trying to watch two movies at once, it's like sickening and then you're never really alone with yourself so when he, t he talks about here was it from him that I learned the long bright silence because being able to be silent and to silence your mind and be comfortable with silence uh, is an important skill in fact s noise deprivation was a form of torture uh, that the Germans did in some of their concentration camps and and also um, today, though, we were able to punish some wicked people with solitary confinement. And then you be, they start to break down. So Winter, when he calls Winter this kind of difficult guest, a wicked guest, you know, there's a, there's a truth to that, you know, but there's a utility as well of Winter. And I, I really enjoy having seasons. If I had to be in a perpetual summer... I would be just absolutely miserable. So, you know, there's there's a balance. Or did he learn it from me? Or did each of us invent it independently? The origin of all good things is tenfold. Sorry, is thousandfold. All good prankish things leap into existence from sheer joy. How could one expect them to do that only once? Long silence, too, is good prankish thing. And to look out of a bright, rounded, eyed face. So to look out a brow, bright, round-eyed face. Like the winter sky. And tactically to hide one's sun and one's indomitable solar will. Solar will. Verily, this art... And this winter prank I have learned well. It is my favorite malice and the art of and the art that my silence has. Huh, the art that my silence has. Has learned not to betray itself through silence. Not to betray yourself through silence. Mm. Kind of, okay, not to betray yourself through silence. So when you're guilty of something, like, did you do this? Did you do this? And then you're like, you're like, I'm not saying anything. So you wear this look, the shroud of guilt. You betrayed yourself. You would have said, like, no, I didn't do that. Even though you did. You see? We're being quiet. You're consenting almost to the guilt. Yet, the Fifth Amendment, right? I, I part of the Fifth. I, 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 I take the Fifth. Like, you know. You just be quiet and let your lawyer handle it, so. There's <laughs> ways of looking at it. Rattling with discourse and dice, I outwit those who wait solemnly. My will and purpose shall elude all these severe inspectors, that no one may discern my ground and ultimate will, for that I have invented my long, bright silence. Many I found who were clever, they veiled their faces and muddied their waters that nobody might see through them, deep down. But precisely to them came the clever mistrusters and nutcrackers. Precisely their most hidden fish were fished out. Ooh, hit the most hidden fish fished out. It is the bright, the bold, the transparent who are cleverest among those who are silent. Ooh, let's read that again. It is the bright, the bold, the transparent who are cleverest among those who are silent. Their ground is down to deep that even the brightest water does not betray it. 
You snow-bearded silent winter sky, you round-eyed white head above me. Oh, you heavenly parable of my soul and its pranks. And must I not conceal myself like one who has swallowed gold, lest they slit open my soul? Must I not walk on stilts, that they overlook my long legs? All these grudge joys and drudge boys who surround me. Grudge joys, so they, they take joy in have, holding these grudges against you. They don't cease of it, doesn't affect them. Holding the grudges that make them sick. Drudgery. People who are not uh, broken by monotony. These smoky room, temperature used up, wilted, fretful souls. How could their grudge endure my happiness? Hence, I show them only the ice in the winter of my peaks. And not that my mountain still winds all the belts of the sun round itself. They hear only my winter winds whistling, and not that I also cross warm seas. Like longing, heavy, hot south winds, they still have pity. My accidents, but my word says, let accidents come to me. They are innocent as little children. How could they endure my happiness if I did not wrap my happiness in accidents and winter distress and polar bear caps and covers of snowy heavens if I, myself, did not have mercy on their pity? which is the pity of grudge joys and drudge boys, if I myself did not sign, sigh before them, and chatter with cold and patiently suffer them to wrap me in their pity. This is the wise frolicsomeness and friendliness of my soul, that it does not conceal its winter and its icy winds, nor does it conceal its chill bellies. Loneliness can be the escape of the sick. Loneliness can also be escape from the sick. That's true. You know, you have to isolate sometimes. Let them hear me chatter and sigh with the winter cold. All these poor jealous jokers around me with such sighing and chattering, I still escape their heated rooms. So when when you're chilling, ch ch if you've ever been that cold, you need to be around some body heat and the more people who gather in a room your body heat like makes it warmer in there and when you're by yourself in your bed you're not going to be as warm as if you're around like other people in the room right so when he says i still escape their heated rooms he doesn't even seek their warmth think about that the ice of knowledge will yet freeze him to death they moan. Meanwhile, I run crisscross on my mount of olives with warm feet in the sunny nook of my mount of olives. I sing and I mock all pity. Thus sang Zarathustra. This time he sang. Instead of saying thus spoke, this time he says thus sang. So the thing about olives is they need a Mediterranean climate. No winter from my understanding. I don't think... I've never had to grow an olive tree, but my uncle had olive trees. But we're, he lives kind of like by uh, the Yosemite region. My my dad's uncle, so he'd be my great uncle. Uh, I haven't spoken to him in years. Not really close with him at all. You know, but uh, he had olive trees. The, the deer was always trying to eat the olives. And it doesn't snow up there, I think. I'm not sure the life cycle of the thing, but when you get in the fruit of the olive, it has to be summertime. You're not gonna get olives in the blistering, bitter cold, right? Because a few things grow in, in that level of chilliness. Okay, the next section is on passing by. Thus walking slowly among many peoples and through numerous towns, Zarathustra returned on roundabout paths to his mountain and his cave and on the way he also came unexpectedly to the gate of the great city but here a foaming fool jumped toward him with outspread hands and barred his way this however was the same fool 
whom the people called Zarathustra's ape, for he had gathered something of his phrasing and cadences, and also liked to borrow from the treasures of his wisdom. But the fool spoke thus to Zarathustra. O Zarathustra, here's the great city. Here you could find nothing and lose everything. Ooh, ooh. Oh, you could find nothing and lose everything. Sounds like New York, New Las Vegas. Sounds like Los Angeles. Sounds like San Francisco. Trying to find a person to marry. Instead, you get addicted to drugs. Uh, get robbed by gangbangers. Get mixed up with the wrong people. Lose everything. Right? Not a blessed city. Right, get it? So the calling it a great city, but then you find nothing and lose everything. <laughs> Obviously, it's not great, or it's a great evil, right? Why do you want to wade through this mire? Have pity on your foot, rather spit on the city gate and turn back. Here is hell for a hermit's thoughts. Ooh, here is hell for a hermit's thoughts. Here, great thoughts are boiled alive. And cooked till they are small, here all great feelings decay. Only the smallest rattle bone feelings may rattle here. Don't you smell the slaughterhouses and ovens of the spirit even now? Does not this town steam with the fumes of slaughtered spirits? Ooh. Talk about, he should have wrote, I wonder if he ever wrote anything like horror. Because he's got way with words here. A, a town steaming with the fumes of slaughtered spirits. I once had a dream that it was like this weird crematorium type of place where s snow was falling from the sky and there was this large smokestack with black smoke coming out and there was all these guards and it was like this lot of stairs to go up to the top and there was like a platform like a plateau it's interesting that he mentions that don't you see the soul hanging? And like in the dream, they were like putting people on the vats and then putting them in. Next body, putting them in. It was like a conveyor belt. Don't you see the soul hanging like a limp, dirty rag? And they still make newspapers of these rags? Don't you hear how the spirit has here been reduced to plays on words? It vomits revolting verbal swill. And they still make new newspapers of this swill. So here we see newspapers of these rags, newspapers of this swill. So that to me that sounds a lot today like social media. Social media algorithms. Uh, like Kai Sinat, Aiden Ross, Logan Paul, uh, Adam22. Um, these type of influencers and there's like Whitney Cummings I would argue is one of the degenerates just people who push swill who push just dirtiness Andrew Schultz is one of them as well their spirits are really sick It's they are very revolting people you know and they still get media attention it's very fascinating they hound each other and know not where. They overheat each other and know not why. They tinkle their tin. They jingle with their gold. They are cold and seek warmth from brandy. They are heated and sink coolness from frozen spirits. They are all diseased and sick with public opinions. Ooh, all diseased and sick with public opinions. That's, that's bars. So brandy, alcohol warms you up. Frozen spirits, like blended pina coladas, like things like that. Uh, micheladas, so another type of iced, uh, you know, cocktails, essentially. And so, if your body feels chilly, you drink something warm. When, but the thing is, wait, okay, so alcohol is called spirits. Right? And he's talking here about souls hanging limp. And then he's talking about frozen spirits. So think about that play on words here. Unmanaged, poorly defective souls are drinking 
spirits to make them feel better. <laughs> see that? If in some stores today, you'll see spirits. They start to into change and just say liquor. But uh, it's it's funny that he's insulting some of these spiritually sick people and how they seek out alcohol, aka spirits. Yeah. All lust and vices are at home here. Ooh. All lust and vices are at home here. But there are also some here who are virtuous. There is much serviceable, serving virtue, much serviceable virtue with pen fingers and hard sitting and waiting flesh, blessed with little stars on the chest and with paddled, rumpled daughters. There is also much piety. There are many devout lickspittles, batteries of fakers and flattery bakers before the God of hosts. For it is from above that the stars and the gracious spittle trickle, every starless chest longs above. The moon has her courtyard and the courtyard has its moon calves to everything, however, that comes from the court. The beggarly mob and all serviceable beggar virtue pray. I serve, you serve, we serve, thus all serviceable virtue prays to the prince, that the deserved star may finally be pinned on the narrow chest. That the deserved star may finally be pinned on the chest. So to serve, and then um, awards. So if you look at those generals who have those stars hanging, right? How they serve their country. They get a pin. Maybe there's other type of uh, old-fashioned uniforms where you like where people you could get like decorated. The way they would call it. So that's not an exactly a thing anymore, no. Right. But in certain fields, like the military, you would get that type of a pin. You know. So, pinned on the narrow chest. So. Think how he insulted the person here. The narrow chest. It's not very, like, broad. Yeah, you know, like, the bodybuilders. Like, yeah. Like, they have a very open chest. They do exercises and heavy lifting to make their pexes more open. The narrow chest is, like, hasn't actually done heavy weight. They've only served. So he's making it sound like these are groveling, sniveling uh, people. Because he's saying barely mob serviceable beggars like you know he's painting something for us here the moon however still revolves around all that is earthly so too the prince still revolves around that which is earthliest but that is the gold of the shopkeeper the god of host is no god of gold bars the prince's purposes, but the shopkeeper disposes. So the prince proposes, but the shopkeeper disposes. So he did this again. Remember in the last one? Proposes, disposes, up and out. By everything in you that is bright and strong and good, O Zorathustra, spit on this city of shopkeepers and turn back. Here all blood flows putrid. Here all blood flows putrid. See, this is really making us think about Babylon. Babylon. Sodom. And Gomorrah. Really just archetypical wicked cities. America is filled with that. Miami. It's all about sin, gambling. I mean, PDD just got arrested for freak offs. He had a thousand bottles of lube. It's really disgusting what PDD has done. He's a very degenerate individual, and his his mansion was in Miami. He's part of that also that LA lifestyle, Hollywood, and so their blood flows putrid. And remember, he's also he said. You, you find nothing and lose everything. Here is hell for a hermit's thoughts. And then he contends, right? Great thoughts are boiled alive. Cooked to their small. Cooked to their small. So they're reduced down. 
And if you cooked anything, you do a reduction, you make it concentrated, you know, it gets smaller and smaller. And so, you go into the hive of the city, so many of them, you tell them, you know, you shouldn't live like this, you should get sober, you should do this. Then they're like, these people, they are constantly high, seeking money, seeking attention in the most negative ways, very self-destructive, you know. Los Angeles, the city of lost angels, they would call it. You can see how this reigns true for a lot of American towns. So I really enjoy his potent language here. And lukewarm and spew me through all the veins, spit on the great city, which is the great swill, room where all the swill spooms together, spit on the city of compressed souls. See here, I've talked about these high-rise buildings in New York. The apartments. No balcony, no trees. You're compressed like a beehive, which is not good for humans. Us, we need space. You need that. You know, it's unhealthy to live in these compressed Harry Potter-sized places. You're just stacked on top like you're a battery. Go to work, go home, plug into the online world, spend your life in the digital realm, get high, fornicate, back to work, like, you know, like this is not how we should live. And I, I think it's absolutely brilliant that he said this because it really hits on a note that I've been thinking about for a long time. Compressed souls and narrow chests of Popeyes and sticky fingers on the city of the obtrusive, the impudent, the scribble and scream throats. The overheated, ambitious, conceited, or everything infirm, infamous, lustful, dusky, over-musty, pussy, and plotting putrefies together, spit on the great city and turn back. So infamous. So in the city, like Los Angeles, the more whorish a woman becomes, and the more lustful the men are, the more they get more of a social media following. And... Infirm, you could talk about people who glorify having these mental illnesses, some people making up mental illnesses. Uh, there's a lot of ways in which the infirm and the weirdos try to become like the most popular. So this, the scream throats, people are always shouting and screaming. They're always trying to be all up in people's way. I'm walking here! And stuff like that. Overheated, ambitious, conceited. This looks like the someone who doesn't have very well their emotions in check. So your boss, when he turns red face and he's screaming at you and he wants to get those numbers right. Urgh! And he just looks in the mirror and sees himself as like the next Trump. And he's like, I'm just so special. Why won't these peons do their jobs? And so, he's not kind to his employees. He just wants to climb. Thinks he's the most special boy. Describing the personalities that flock to the city. Here, however, Zarathustra interrupted the foaming fool and put his hands over the fool's mouth. Stop at last, cried Zarathustra. Your speech and your manner have long nauseated me. Why did you live near the swamp so long until you yourself have become a frog and toad? Ooh! Why did you live near the swamp so long until you yourself became a frog and a toad? Does not putrid, spummy swamp blood flow through your own veins now that you have learned to croak and revile thus? Croak? Revile? Why... <clears throat> Why have you not gone into the woods or to plow the soil? So, the woods, getting back to nature, farming. Think of the shire, right? Plow the soil, so we can also say gardens as well. Agriculture. Does not the sea abound on green islands? I despise your despising. 
And if you warned me, why did you not warn yourself? Out of love alone shall my despising and my warning bird fly up, not out of the swamp. I warn people against moving to California, but I don't have the money to move. So that would be my rebuttal. If you got the money to move, then, you know, that's quite different. They call you my ape, you foaming fool. But I call you my grunting swine. <laughs> so he's called an ape. And then the pig. With your grunting, you spoil for me my praise of folly. What was it that first made you grunt? That nobody flattered you sufficiently? Ooh, what was it that made you first grunt? You sat down to this filth, so as to have reason to grunt much, to have reason for much revenge, for all your foaming is revenge, you vain fool. I guessed it well. Ooh, all your foaming is like revenge. So it sounds like he, this person is seeking out something to complain about, however, you know, he has a point, that guy, you know. But your fool's words injure me, even where you are right. And even if Zarathustra's words were a thousand times right, still you would always do wrong with my words. So he has. So even if he understood Zarathustra's knowledge, he would do wickedness with that knowledge. Mm. Wouldn't use it in a sort of beneficial way. Thus spoke Zarathustra, and he looked at the great city sighed and long remained silent. At last he spoke thus. I am nauseated by this great city too, and not only by this fool. Here, as there, there is nothing to better, nothing to worsen. Woe unto this great city, and I wish I already saw the pillar of fire which it will be burned. So, pillar of fire burning down the city, for such pillars of fire must precede the great noon. But this has its own time, and its own destiny. This doctrine, however, I give you full, as a parting present. Where one can no longer love, there one should pass by. Thus spoke Zarathustra, and he passed by the fool and the great city. So, gives him a final quote. Where one can no longer love, there one should pass by. So if you can't find love and you're just in a just totally wicked environment, you gotta leave. Makes me think a lot about when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to flood during the time of Noah, you know. And look at Prophet Lot, Luth, alayhi salam, peace be upon Noah and Lot. How there's just few people good there and how those places were destroyed. You need to keep it moving. I was thinking a lot about how when certain places become bad, you just have to migrate. You look at elephants migrating, wildebeest migrating, butterflies, you name it. I think us humans have to do that too. Because that's why I think ultra-nationalism and racial stuff is absurd. Because every land is going to go through some type of change. It's really just about going to lands that have, you know, good food and water, not too much pollution, crime under control. You know, stability for the human soul. And if you're in a wicked place that you can't do that, then it's time to move on. You can't save every last one, but you can pray for the children and the innocent elderly, right? Let me know what you think. It was a great section. I really liked it. Nietzsche is very witty, and I don't agree with everything he says sometimes, obviously. But I, I think that's what makes a good book is that you know, you disagree sometimes or you're perplexed, right? Please like, comment, and subscribe. If you'd like to support my work, you can go to www.subscribestar.com slash Hope to see you there.